afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fifth installment of the Spring 2021 QSide Colloquium Series. We're so excited to have you all here with us today. My name is Haley Taylor, and I work as a senior fellow at the QSide Institute. Just a few operational notes. At the end of this session, we're going to adjourn to a standard Zoom meeting for a more informal cocktail slash coffee hour where we can all chat a little more informally with each other. We'd also like to encourage any of you who are joining us today who are not officially members of our affiliate program or our consortium to consider joining. The affiliate program is free to join and the links are avail available on the screen right now. The consortium program is a paid membership program, but anyone wishing to join can apply for a scholarship if budgets are tight. Links to those are on the screen and I'll include them in the meeting chat after the introduction. Today's colloquium is the fifth of six to come this spring and another installment in the exciting programming that we've planned for QSide in 2021. Our colloquium series features several exciting speakers who are going to discuss issues related to theory, activism, and technical tools, all to shed a light on a broad range of topics related to inclusion, diversity, and equity. Please visit our colloquium webpage and consider registering for and sharing information about the upcoming talks that we've planned with any colleagues you think might be interested in. We're also incredibly excited to announce the inaugural launch of our Data for Justice conference on April 16th, 2021. It will take place completely virtually and feature talks from experts in our five research areas, inclusion in the arts, criminal justice, healthcare equity, environmental justice, and education equity, as well as a keynote address from Heather McGee, former president of Demos and co-chair of Color of Change. A select few registrants will also receive a free copy of McGee's latest book. Beyond our upcoming events, you can engage with QSide and our mission right now. Driver, Diversity in Research Through Inclusive and Equitable Referencing is a collectively built database hosted on our website of scholarly work by researchers marginalized by different axes of identity. With over 3,000 references, our goal is to encourage the citation of marginalized scholars in academic and scholarly works and help further their careers. You can help support this mission and elevate their work by incorporating it into your research and citation practices. If you would like to support QSide in the production of more exciting research and activism initiatives, we would graciously appreciate any and all donations made to our organization. Your support is what keeps us going. As we progress through our session today, we welcome questions for our speaker using the Q&A feature of the webinar. We'll have time at the end of the presentation for some answers. And one last note, please be advised that today's session is being recorded and will be displayed publicly on the QSide web and social media channels. Now, it's my great privilege to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Shilad Sen, Associate Professor of Mathematics, Statistics, and Computer Science at McAllister College. Professor Shen Sen, excuse me, studies member-maintained websites that empower internet users to contribute information we find valuable, such as photographs on Flickr and articles on Wikipedia. He focuses on tagging systems, recommender systems, and combinations of the two. His research draws upon the fields of HCI, data mining, psychology, and computer systems design. Professor Sen teaches a wide range of computer science courses, including object-oriented programming and data structures, internet programming, and collective intelligence. He is an avid squash player and also plays saxophone in several Twin Cities jazz groups. Thank you so much for being with us today, Professor Sen. My pleasure. Thanks for that introduction, Haley. Um, I'm really excited to be um, joining all of you today. And I am going to take a moment to set up my screen here. I'm doing something I haven't uh, done before, so it might take a minute, but I, I practiced it, and so it should be doable. So here we go. I'm going to share a screen. Now you're seeing something, but not what you want to see. Just a minute here. Okay, there we go. Well, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for joining me today. Um, so my name is Shalad Sen, uh, and I am a professor of data. I would call myself a professor of data science and computer science at McAllister. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, a, uh, a kind of new idea I've been thinking about uh, right now um, about data science and discomfort 
and about the um, amount of growth that people, especially students, can see if they think about this um, field of data science in another way. And I thought that one um, maybe a compelling way to tell this story is about um, how I, my personal narrative to, to kind of reach there. And my hunch is um, from what I know about QSide uh, that you all might be quite a diverse audience in many different ways. Like you might have very different racial identities. You might um, have very different professional fields. And so I think some of this will resonate with you and some of you may be coming from a very different place. Um, the second half of this talk, I wanna talk about a new idea for me that I've been thinking a lot about, and that's how to transform data science education into a type of curriculum where the skill growth and the growth that you see is not just um, about dealing with data and being fluent um, with trying to um, communicate data, but actually trying to work with partners, um, trying to build relationships with partners who are uh, culturally quite different from you uh, and trying to understand those partners' needs. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about that. Uh, and I'm going to just talk about some ideas I have about it. It is not well formed. And so uh, I feel uncomfortable even doing this, presenting these ideas. And I'm hoping uh, for feedback. And, and uh, I'll be taking lots of notes as people um, during the Q&A section. Uh, but because my talk is about embracing discomfort, I thought that would be a reasonable way to go. Um, and then the other thing I'll say is my slides um, are going to be posted on, on the QSide website after that. So if you want to get back to anything, you can do it there. Okay, so here's a little bit about my uh, kind of the arc of my research. Uh, and so I started in the area of recommender systems, which is now kind of squarely in AI or data science. So if you go to Amazon, it recommends things for you. I worked at a very early recommender systems um, startup in the late 90s. We served Blockbuster and uh, Comcast and a number of other things. Uh, I loved what I was doing, went back to grad school, and I started working on different kinds of systems, tagging systems. Uh, I moved on uh, to work on Wikipedia, uh, and more recently, my work has focused more on bias and activism. Um, and so I'm going to talk about that progression. And I think for me, it's like a pro progression into more and more human data and more and more kind of human human uh, values. So I would consider myself as someone who centers human-centered algorithms. So I think about a life cycle of algorithms and how humans are in that loop. So I do some algorithmic work. It's almost always with data that humans create, either um, intentionally or unintentionally. Those algorithms power some websites that are used by humans and humans on those uh, websites or apps also create things. So this kind of is a life cycle uh, of, of human-centered algorithms. And, and you can think about um, the, the kind of way algorithms react to different uh, humans with different identities or different cultures and the way humans therefore react to those algorithms. And I've done some work in those areas. So as I've said, I'm going to be talking about kind of an arc of research that becomes increasingly human and increasingly expressive. Um, and uh, I think that will convey a little bit about where I'm coming from with the second half of the talk. Um, so I started, as I said, um, at working at a startup, we had these, uh, uh, these computer boxes that would get installed with touch screens into Blockbuster stores. We were in hundreds of Blockbuster stores. Maybe some of you saw them. Uh, and people would go up to these machines and they would rate a bunch of movies and get um, movies in, recommended to them. Um, that problem uh, is a problem that is really, really highly studied. Thousands and thousands of people have studied it uh, and published papers on it. Um, and that problem looks at uh, completing something most people would call the ratings matrix. So in the ratings matrix, you have um, on the top, you have columns associated with movies. And on the bottom, you have rows associated with people. Uh, and your goal is given some known data in that matrix, you want to try to predict some unknown data. Okay, so uh, this is a beautiful, uh, simple problem formulation. I call it the one true matrix formulation. Um, and it has attracted 
a tremendous amount of research interest. Um, part of that is due to a contest that Netflix ran uh, for a million dollars um, to try to improve uh, uh, their recommender system uh, that did that kind of matrix, one true matrix view of things. Uh, and I could talk about that uh, prize and that contest for you know 20 minutes. It was really, really interesting. Um, there were some innovations that came out of it. Um, it turns out Netflix didn't really directly use any of them and used it some secondary innovations. So that was kind of interesting. So that was my background. Uh, I went to grad school and I went to study um, with a research group at the University of Minnesota called GroupLens. And GroupLens, one of the really cool things about GroupLens is they have um, a public website called MovieLens that has a reasonable amount of traffic. Thousands of people every week come to MovieLens and they try to do what I worked on on my startup. They rate movies, they receive movie recommendations in return. Uh, and in the kind of mid 2000s, uh, there was this idea from some people on the team that, you know, it might be really interesting to have users describe movies um, in kind of free language and just see what kind of evolves and then what you can do with that data. We called it adjective world. Um, at the same time, that feature was becoming really popular and it was known as tagging. Uh, and so my PhD dissertation studied, I, I I created this tagging system in movie lens, and then I ran a variety of experiments. And I'll show you one of them that really kind of blew my mind. Um, uh, but, you know, it, I moved kind of from this really atomic piece of information about users that was um, really easy to manipulate and huge levels of aggregation, a rating, to a slightly more expressive form of information that users provide, a piece of text. Um, so the thing that we were initially interested in is thinking about vocabulary. So as people start describing these movies and movie lens, anyone can do it. Um, what kinds of vocabularies evolve? And we had a piece of evidence that suggested it was a dynamic and volatile process. And here, this, here it is. You know, Amazon introduced a tagging feature uh, and uh, they've taken it off since. And, and uh, but they used to have one. And um, there's a site called Library Thing that's still around. It's a really great website. But if you looked back in 2004 or whatever, five, um, and you looked at this book, a neoconservative book, Lib Liberal Fascism, The Secret History of the American Left, you could look at the tags that were applied to this book on two different sites. The same book, right? The same book, very similar interfaces, two different sites. Um, and you can see that the types of tags that evolved in these two systems were dramatically different. Um, and so on the library thing site, you have this very factual set of objective kind of tags. Um, and on the Amazon site, you have tags that are mostly subjective, probably intended for humorous reasons. Uh, and so I got really interested in this, like, why is this happening? You know, there, is it the system? Is it the people? Uh, and so I ran an experiment when we launched tagging on movie lines to try to understand like what happens uh, if you have a very similar um, system and uh, you have replicas of that system and you just let things kind of organically evolve. Uh, so we we start when we launched movie lines, we split up the tagging world into four separate universes and we let each of those universes evolve. And then we looked at the type of tags that um, were created in each of them. And we coded these tags using humans, uh, ourselves, as factual, subjective, or personal. Personal meaning like in my DVD queue or one of my favorites is a personal tag. And factual and subjective are probably pretty uh, straightforward. And what we found was that uh, those vocabularies evolved dramatically differently. Um, and so this was kind of mind blowing to me. You know, I, I had thought about tags as kind of an expressive form of uh, text, but I hadn't thought about the collective dynamics of individuals. When individuals with different identities come together um, and, you know, they have this self reinforcing cycles, what evolves? Well, there's different cultures in these four systems. Um, and this kind of blew my mind. Um, so, uh, 
I did a lot of work on tagging system, but after I, I graduated, I started, you know, getting again, more and more interested um, in uh, kind of more expressive kinds of user interaction, more human data. Um, and so I got interested in uh, Wikipedia. I did a lot of research in Wikipedia. Um, so uh, you all know Wikipedia. Things you might know, not know about Wikipedia are that there's 279 different language edition. There's a huge community um, of people and there's infrastructure that's kind of created through Wikipedia pages to, um, to organize, that they use to organize themselves, to self-organize. Um, so there's all kinds of interesting cultural um, uh, studies that people have done into different types of editors, uh, people who have edited different pages in different languages. Um, but there's this whole human side of it that I became very interested in. Um, so I did some work on um, gender bias. I, you know, I started kind of thinking more about these cultural aspects and, and uh, um, being at McAllister, uh, like many other liberal arts college, some places, a place that really um, thinks hard about um, civic engagement and uh, equity and social justice. I, I, I was thinking more about how that could translate into elements of my research. Um, and uh, I, I was very interested in uh, kind of gender and how it played out in Wikipedia. And there was some anecdotal evidence that um, it played out in really stereotypically um, hostile and caustic ways uh, against women. Um, and so we did a variety of research. This is not mine. This is earlier, this is worth research by someone else. Um, Claudia Wagner about different uh, biographies for men and women and the kinds of language that's used in them. Um, and so you can see that women are often um, described uh, regardless of whether um, they're kind of more recent biographies or older biographies in kind of domestic terms, while men are described using more professional terms. Um, and we, uh, both through, because of this and because of some popular press articles that were being done, got really interested in this idea that we might be able to objectively measure some of these differences. And so we did a really fun study where we tried to, so this is kind of a collaboration with my old research group who had a lot of data about movies. And so we focused on this data about movies and we had ways of determining popularity and quality of movies from this other site, Movie Lens. And we looked at the articles in Wikipedia about these different movies and tried to model like what, what goes in to a high quality article versus a low quality article. Where are Wikipedians putting their attention? Um, and uh, we found some really interesting results. So if we kind of cross uh, linked the information about interest in movies by gender that we had from Movie Lens against the Wikipedia data. So at the extremes, uh, movies that were more of interest to women were three times shorter than movies of interest to men. Uh, and so this was a really um, surprise, just the, the I, I guess it wasn't surprising to me that there was an effect. The size of the effect was really, really surprising. So a movie like Rambo, for example, is gonna be ridiculously long, while a movie like Bridges in Madison County will be quite short, even after you control for things like box office spend and popularity, things like that. Um, so I built a system uh, that kind of visualized this called Cartograph. If you go to my website, which I'll link at the end of this talk, you can see that. Uh, and we, I tried to look, this is a visualization of gender focus on Wikipedia. Um, blue is a focus on men, red is a focus on women. Um, and you can see it's just a sea of blue. Uh, and this, you know, in some ways reflects the Wikipedia community. And in, I think, even more ways reflects uh, just the history, how history has been recorded. Um, Okay, uh, so I, I started thinking about other elements of um, equity on Wikipedia and um, one that I, I became very interested in was geographic equity, geographic bias in Wikipedia. 
Um, and a real simple way of measuring this, this is not a picture that I did, um, but it is a picture that shows uh, a single dot for every Wikipedia article about a place. And you can see that Europe, North America, uh, and some other places are generally lit up. Well, vast regions of Asia, Africa, and South America um, are largely invisible in Wikipedia. So there, there are these kind of biases about who is represented on this encyclopedia. Um, and this was kind of was, was prior work. Um, this, uh, uh, this picture I think is from Wikipedia itself. You can find it there. Um, uh, so I, I was working with some collaborators um, and maybe I'll tell a story about that collaboration because I think it's relevant later on, um, trying to understand uh, where information in Wikipedia came from, like where geographically. Uh, and so we, uh, one simple way of doing this is to look at editors' IP addresses. So we worked with a collaborator at the Wikimedia Foundation um, us keys who provided us uh, with um, at a very, very high level of aggregation information about where uh, folks are coming from as they edit. Um, but we had another view of where information in Wikipedia was coming from. Um, and this, this is a view that was more interesting and actually kind of what spurred that this research and I'll, and I'll talk about a, a collaboration because I think it, it it's related to what I want to say later. So this is a view of the sources that are cited in Wikipedia and how local they are. So dark blue is a country where most of the citations in Wikipedia are local. They're published by that country according to an algorithm we developed. Um, we uh, so I worked with another computer scientist uh, who is fantastic, Dave Musicant. Uh, he teaches at Carleton. And we harvested this huge set of citations in Wikipedia. And we started, we're two computer scientists, right? Very interested in Wikipedia, have published in it before. We started trying to understand patterns in that data, like what sticks around, what doesn't stick around, where are we seeing um, citations there? Um, and we worked a summer on it and we got stuck. Like we just, we had all this big, big data and we didn't know what to do with it. Um, and it was around that time I met Heather Ford, um, who uh, now teaches in Australia, but she's an ethnographer. And she had done, like her research includes um, working with uh, Wikipedians in rural Africa who use dial up to create information about their local villages. So she's done that kind of work. I mean, very, very um, community-based kinds of work. Amazing, amazing researcher. And she, you know, we went to this conference to talk about uh, an early version of our work and Heather saw us uh, coming at it from a very different angle. And she's like, you know, I think I can answer some really interesting questions with the data that you have, um, but we just have to think about this a little differently. Uh, and so we kind of launched into this collaboration and we've done several things since um, that kind of drew upon her expertise, which was not in computer science, it was in ethnography to try to build these kinds of, um, these kinds of geographic models uh, of, of uh, participation. Um, okay, so I wanna talk in just a little more detail about uh, my, one of my more recent projects. Um, one that was published last year about collective action. Um, and I'm just gonna situate this for a moment. This is kind of moving towards um, more human data, right? You know, so we we went from ratings to text to Wikipedia to talking about geography and Wikipedia, which I, I feel is kind of getting much more, um, much more human. So um, I wanna talk about collective action on tech platforms. So I'm gonna give you a couple examples of this. So uh, in 2015, uh, 2015, Victoria Taylor, who organized the AMA communities on Wikipedia, um, she was a community organizer. She was fired 
um, Wikipedians protested by boycotting Wikipedia. So here's a uh, graph of Wikipedia. They're uh, think a network visualization where communities are connected if they're similar in some measure. And you can see that um, large chunks of Wikipedia, uh, sorry, of Reddit have, have blacked out during this time, uh, did not participate. And this led to a movement to ask uh, the then CEO, Ellen Powell, to step down, um, which she did. Um, so this is one example of collective action, right? Collective action through boycott. Um, there has been collective action numerous times against Facebook, um, typically for uh, uh, racial justice. Um, so uh, there was this, I think, was the result around advertising practices that specifically targeted or did not target um, people of particular races. Um, there was a boycott uh, and it led to a, a civil rights audit. Another interesting example of collective action on tech that isn't about a boycott, but is more about organizing is about Mechanical Turk. I think most of you are probably familiar with Mechanical Turk, but it's an online site where people um, uh, can post digital work that they want done and people looking for short digital work, like work that typically will take one to five minutes can complete that work. Um, so here's an example of that. Here's an image and it asks a worker to apply three tags. Uh, and there has been a lot of research that has shown that um, it can be tough to be a Turker. So um, Turkers are often completing these very, very, very short tasks repetitive, repetitively for very little wage. Um, in addition, uh, Amazon did not provide any mechanisms for Turkers to, uh, to um, exert any kind of leverage or influence if a employer, if who's called a requester, if a requester doesn't pay them, if a requester feels that their um, work is not done, or if a requester just posts work that's ridiculous, maybe it doesn't work, which happens a lot actually. Um, and so someone named Lily Irani, an M6 Silberman, um, created a site called Turk Opticon. And there have been various iterations of very similar sites since then. This was in 2013, where Turkers could organize themselves. So you install the Turk Opticon extension, you can go in, you can rate um, each, each requester's kind of jobs, and that gives some visibility into whether Turkers want uh, to take work from a particular requester or not, right? So, so it creates this reputation, even though that's not something, a mechanism that's provided by Amazon. So another kind of collective organizing. So um, let's talk about a little bit about uh, compensation for knowledge work. And so we've, so on one hand, you have paid experts, and I think most of you in the audience would fall into this category. People who um, are traditionally uh, kind of in knowledge uh, fields, knowledge-driven fields who are paid, um, typically have college degrees, et cetera. Um, uh, kind of in the middle, you have people who work on places, at places like Mechanical Turk. So they, what they're actually doing is training, uh, typically providing training information for artificial intelligence algorithms. At the far end, um, you have users of so-called free services uh, who are training AIs as part of their uh, engagement with that service. So Facebook, Google, um, every time you do a Google search, right? Google uh, learns from what you're doing. Um, Facebook learns from what you're doing as you're posting messages. Uh, and if you're carrying your phone, Apple Maps or whatever, Google Maps is, is making maps of the world based on how you navigate it. Um, and, you know, I think pe some people might argue it that you're getting the free service in, in return, but at a macro level, you can just think about the amount of profit those machine, those companies are making. Okay, and so we wanted to think about collective action for people who are primarily using these free services. Okay, this is a um, collaboration with uh, Nick Vincent and Brent Hecht 
um, Brent teaches at Northwestern. Nick's uh, uh, a PhD student there, or was a PhD student there. And we wondered, you know, are there ways that we can measure collective action in platforms like this? Um, and let me give you uh, a cup a, a framing idea, and it's called data labor. So this idea that as you use these systems, you are performing labor for them. You are creating posts, you are uploading images, you are writing reviews, you are um, rating things, you are clicking things. Um, and what you get in compensation for your labor is a free service. And again, you can think about, are you adequately being compensated for your labor? So let's say you're unhappy with either the company you're providing labor for, or just maybe the, the comp level of compensation you're getting for, a lab for that labor. What can you do? You can boycott that company. And I showed you examples of how you can do that. And what happens when you boycott that company? You stop using their service altogether. You, you, uh, so you stop using Facebook. You lose revenue. Uh, they lose revenue from purchases. They lose re revenue from advertising impressions. A second type of collective action that we were interested in is called a data strike. So you could choose to keep using that service, but try to change or restrict the type of data that you give them. So you still receive some of the benefits of that service, but because you want to make some change, you highly restrict the amount of information you're providing for them. This is like, um, performing Google searches, but then restricting, just getting the um, results and not sending in the information back. And you might think, well, that's a ridiculous thing. You can't do that. Um, but it turns out that you can. Uh, there is um, legislation that makes it easier. You can recall your data. Um, and there's actually also plugins that allow you to do this. And I'll show you some sometimes. So what we were interested in is specifically is the difference between the effect of a boycott. So here, if you're, if you boycott a service like Facebook, this data is quite old, but Facebook is going to lose literally billions of dollars if lots of people boycott, boy, boycott. We, but we were interested in something we call a data strike. So what if you install an extension, these extensions exist, that really limits the data that goes back. Okay, so you can still use a service, but you're not providing data back. Those algorithms are not gonna learn from your data. So what we did is we ran a study um, and we started kind of withholding different, we simulated different kinds of, of, uh, of data strikes. So what if certain amounts of the population uh, and certain types of people withhold their data? How does that uh, affect algorithms? And so here is uh, uh, one result from that. You can see the top line is the um, accuracy of a, uh, a recommender system with state-of-the-art algorithms. And then as people boycott the system, you walk along the x-axis and the performance of the system drop, 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 drops. Um, and to give you an idea, um, this uh, red line is kind of the effect of a personalized system uh, versus a system that always predicts the global average. That uh, in uh, 2015, I believe, was equated to a billion dollars for Netflix. So there's a huge amount of dollars at stake for a company in that range. Um, and you can see this, uh, this uh, green line here, this is kind of the state-of-the-art algorithm as of, I don't know, 2012 or something like that. Um, and so if about 40% of the users of a system like this boycott, um, you can kind of knock technology back that many years. So the last thing I wanna say about this, we simulated all kinds of different strikes. Um, what if you have just people randomly striking? We, they have no shared identity. Or what if you have uh, diff people with some shared identity striking? What happens then? Um, and we found really interesting um, effects that basically said, as a group's preferences become more and more distinctive or unique, the effect of that group striking has more power, right? Has more leverage. Um, there are really interesting ethical issues to impact with that finding. So, you know, you're, if you 
if you uh, are in one of these distinctive groups and you strike, uh, you're going to cause um, uh, you're going to cause the company to lose more money, but you're also going to cause more harm on that group itself. So um, they're interesting ethical things that that I think need to be worked out there. Um, so this is uh, was an interesting moment for me in my research trajectory because I kind of shifted from um, thinking about uh, a data set I had been familiar with for years, the one true matrix view of, of a recommender system and kind of rethinking of, thinking of it from this new frame, from this activist frame. Uh, and it really got me uh, thinking about how I, um, my data science education, about what I do in the classroom. Um, oh, I, before going on, I should just say I, that uh, I, I also have gotten involved in sentencing disparities with uh, a whole bunch of people associated with QSide, a really interesting project with some new findings that will be coming online in the next few months. So stay tuned for that. All right, so um, before I start talking about data science education, and I think that'll take about 10 minutes just to prep you, I just wanna give you a little bit of background into how I'm thinking about this change. So, um, you know, my work, uh, my research work had become more and more um, human, I would say, like the data was richer and richer. I was thinking about um, community and culture in these different ways, um, but that's my professional life. But in my personal life, I have these, you know, I'm, I have these two wonderful kids, Sydney and Stella, they're both in Minneapolis public schools. Minneapolis public schools, some of you on here probably have kids there, a few of you at least, um, but it's a highly diverse um, school system where 60% of the students are kids of color. Our school happens to have relatively few kids of color, um, but I got very involved um, in equity work, both in my kids' school and in the, uh, the school district at large. And it, I, I had the privilege to be involved um, in many, many challenging, uncomfortable um, uh, conversations with people uh, who I learned a lot from. Uh, and, you know, I was thinking about uh, this idea of data science for good, right? Data science for good that I teach in my classrooms. I'll give you an example of a class that I taught with a colleague, which was a, a really fun class and, the, and data science for good, um, but about how uh, typically those kinds of, uh, those kinds of curriculums do not directly connect to the individuals who, are purportedly being served. And uh, whereas in my case, in my own personal uh, equity work, all of the growth happened in dialogue, right? It's all through dialogue. Um, and so what I wanna talk about for the last 10 minutes is this idea and it's half-baked, it's just forming. And I'm hoping some of you have, um, things, models you can share from with me from other um, fields that do this well. So, um, so I teach data science. That's I probably a third of my um, course load at McAllister is, is teaching the data science. Uh, and our, our classes typically, you know, our students are interested uh, in service. And so we often teach uh, classes with data science classes with a da data science for good bent. Um, but uh, I think it's important to think critically about this and um, to channel um, uh, Dr. Ruha Benjamin at Princeton, who said this in a, in a keynote recently, you have to ask yourself, who's good? Like who, who's good is, who is being served by this? Um, and I really believe that uh, education, data science education is where you can make a difference here. You gotta start early, instilling particular values in, in students. So I teach at McAllister. We have a, a focus on service to society. I have worked with wonderful, wonderful students. So a lot of the work that you see here is done by undergrads. It's one of my favorite things to do. Super smart, super dedicated. They wanna make a difference in the world. Mac students go on to do all kinds of amazing things. Like I'm sure like students uh, at the institutions that you are at, the higher ed institutions. Uh, so here are four of our recent grads. Um, Ruthie worked on anti-bias at Airbnb. Katie um, uh, 
uh, worked to digitally map Ohio, provide the first digital maps of Ohio voter precincts. Um, Tyler developed an anti-PST PTSD smartwatch app that just was um, approved, certified. Um, Quadamac launched a math institute. Uh, so these students do just absolutely inspiring things. Uh, and I, I felt like our approach to DS for good maybe is not serving them as well as they could. And so a typical data science for good curriculum looks something like this, right? You um, talk about the data science process, but that process focuses on the data. You obtain the data, you scrub the data, you explore the data, you look, you, you model the data, you interpret the data. You know, where are the humans behind this that are producing data? They are not at all in this particular diagram. Um, so in our classes, a data science for good experience is generally going to look like this. So um, you have a student, they go to a website like Kaggle. Um, a website, Kaggle contains all kinds of interesting data sets. Um, the student downloads that data set. They have an idea for something they'd like to, uh, to uh, an analysis that they'd like to do. Typically, it doesn't work. They try a different one. They just keep trying things until they find something that works with the data they have. They create a visualization. They show it to me. Okay, so that's a typical data science for good process. Um, so even if they're working with, uh, oops, sorry, I'm, here we go. Even if they're working with a data set that is kind of grounded in a community um, that really uh, is, uh, could, is, could benefit from additional resources. For example, Kiva, the, uh, they aren't directly engaging with that community ever. So students still like this. I mean, they really, I think we do a good job and they enjoy these data science classes. And, and, I'll, and I'll share in a moment that that's not, we, we do some other things as well, but they, what do they, like about this. Like a lot of students like the fancy algorithms. They like just working with bigger data than they usually can work with, trying to create patterns from that big data. They like working on cool problems. That Kiva problem is a cool problem. But thinking back, you know, to the one true matrix view of recommender systems, they also like working on really understandable problems, problems that are easy to understand quickly, that you can wrap your head around, that you can um, code up relatively quickly. Um, and you, as you might guess, that does not typically correlate well with the problems that are most important in the world. So again, where is the good in this? Uh, who is this kind of process where you're pulling data sets off a particular website? Uh, who is that helping? Maybe you're acculturating the students to work on certain types of problems, but it seems like you're missing something. Um, and uh, as my colleague, Alicia Johnson, said, uh, and I'll tell, tell you about a course that we talked together. Um, she said she was channeling the data feminism book, but she said, Proc this process doesn't connect with the bodies behind the data. And that is the key gap that we're trying to fill, that I would like to work on filling. So I wanna share um, my last data science for good course uh, and kind of how that went. This is a, again, a, a, um, a class I talk with, taught with my colleague, Alicia Johnson, I think is who, who's on this call. Um, and so in this class, we built upon an um, existing partnership we had with um, the Twin Cities Metropolitan Council, who's in charge of regional planning. So they specifically focus on housing and transit, uh, and they're a large organization. Uh, and so we uh, created a course, we envisioned a course built around this partner, Metro Transit, and questions that came from them and data that came from them. We thought it'd be really neat to put the students um, uh, directly uh, in contact with this partner. So, um, you know, you, you, as you're kind of developing a, a course like this, you have in mind this process, right? So the students will get the problems from the, uh, the partner, the community partner, and you'll go back and forth. If, if the problem needs refinement, the partner will, um, work on this with the students to refine that. Um, if the students don't under, understand something, they'll kind of work again with the partner. So you imagine this dialogue happening. But of course, if any of you who have done this know 
that especially with students who are just starting out, that's not how it happens. An instructor like me or Alicia needs to be in this way we have envisioned this course needs to be in the middle. So they have to be serving as an intermediary. Oh, you you couldn't find that data? Well, our partner who is a valuable resource actually did give you that data. And if you just think about that like this, you can find it. So, you know, we would kind of vet all of the interactions um, students had and forward them on and back. Students did amazing work. Uh, it was a really interesting class and I would call it a success. Um, the partner, um, the partner um, learned some things that they hadn't learned before. Um, we had a lot of interest by students, and I think they would generally view it positive, positively. But just to think a little bit about why it worked well, um, we had an ongoing relationship with this partner. So we had worked with them in the past. We had sent many interns to them. We, that some of those interns had turned into full-time employees. So they actually valued this kind of pipeline with us. Um, they had clear data, they had data needs. We had some alignment of values. Um, and that comes from a lot of uh, different things. Um, but I think one thing to point out is some cultural alignment. I mean, to be direct, the students looked looked a lot like the people in the organization. There were a lot of, um, the organization was predominantly white. It was affluent. People who worked there, they were affluent. They were, um, came from a similar educational background. Uh, so there's a lot of cultural overlap. Um, the partner had resources and this kind of was providing mutual value. So uh, I'm interested in rethinking these kinds of community-based data science projects in ways where um, a lot of where students are directly in contact with partners, all right? And um, not only are they directly in contact with partners, but they're directly in contact with partners from very different cultural um, backgrounds. Uh, so going back to kind of my personal experiences around equity, that has been where I see the most growth. The challenge, of course, is doing this in a way that is beneficial to the community partner. When you think about Metro Transit, who was our, uh, our partner, again, they were predominantly a white organization. Um, the partners we had were data scientists, a lot of cultural overlap. Um, but that's not going to be the case uh, if you're looking at um, community organizations that are quite different from you. So I, you know, I was kind of trying to think about what are some framing devices. Uh, and um, one that uh, came up that my colleague Alicia Johnson again um, suggested to me was this amazing book by Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren Klein called Data Feminism. Uh, and Data Feminism just seemed like an amazing framing device for this particular class. Uh, and so the work of data, I'm just going to going to read this. The work of data feminism is first to tune into how standard practices in data science serve to reinforce the, these existing inequalities. So number one, think about the inequalities. And second, use these skills to challenge the distribution of power. Um, and then one particular idea from that book that I think is really powerful is this idea of co-liberation. Um, and so the idea is you are doing a data for good project, but you're doing a project that has been called out as valuable by a community member. And that project is going to provide lasting benefit to that community partner. You're going to do that work in such a, a way that, that they can take that work and benefit it from it uh, in the future. So what would a curriculum look like? I don't have an answer here, but I just want to share some ideas. Um, so first of all, it cannot be a class. I don't think it can be a class. Um, in order to build, um, to, to kind of uh, provide value for that com community partner, you're gonna need to build on non long-term, non-extractive relationships. So you're gonna have to build trust that you're going to provide value to that community partner. And you're also gonna have to re-envision the educational goals of this curriculum. I mean, it's simply not possible to still have all the data science goals 
uh, that you have uh, and um, invest the same amount of time and have these side effects and achieve those data, data science goals. There's gonna be some trade-offs, but I think they're important trade-offs. There's gonna be a decreased focus on some of the data science skills. There is gonna be an increased focus on some of the more social science skills that are needed. Um, and it's gonna be a curriculum that really centers the values and experience of community partners. Things that I have in mind, you know, are not having the work happen in the classroom, but having the work happen um, out in the field. Uh, and then some of the things that students get out of it that they normally want are building cultural competency, right? So this is the key thing. They engage, they have opportunities to engage in dialogue. Um, and it provides them with authentic DS, data science experience. So they're working on problems, honestly, that you probably will encounter the types of kind of challenges you normally would encounter if you're a data science in any uh, kind of subfield. You're gonna, the, you're not gonna be working with a data set from Kaggle. You're gonna be encountering all kinds of different problems. So I just wanna look at a, two examples of this because people are working on this and I'm hoping that you will also share some examples during the Q&A session. Um, here's one of them, it's called Local Lotto. It's by uh, Lori Rubel. Um, it comes out of uh, MIT and CUNY. So this is a bunch of students who worked in a community in Brooklyn uh, in order to um, try to develop a curriculum that um, both taught kind of the mathematics of, uh, of the lottery and the kind of trade-offs financially in the lottery. So it was, it was, there was a lot of uh, participatory work. There was a lot of um, interviewing with community members. Uh, and then the outcomes were very kind of different than a, uh, uh, than a normal one. Um, another uh, example that I think is really cool is, uh, uh, and these are examples from, this, from the Data Fem Feminism book, is by Rahul and Emily, Emily Bar Bargava at um, the, uh, from MIT, the MIT Center for Civic Media. Um, and it's a data science mural in Somerville, Mass. Um, and there's a community ex organization who came, uh, a, a community agriculture organization who um, had some needs that they thought could be filled in partnership with um, these artists and uh, data scientists. And so they worked together to develop a project that kind of filled those needs. Um, so I'm going to leave it there with like a very open, um, non-closed <laughs> uh, idea at the end. And so I just, uh, I'm hoping, one thing I'm hoping to get out of this is, is that people um, can share models that they think might be work well or might be relevant or, uh, or might be related in some way. I think a lot of them will likely come from other fields. Um, but a lot of what I'm thinking about are just the challenges in developing this kind of curriculum. Um, so I think a really key one is kind of building these relationships with partners and and determining whether there's whether there's actual data science needs. You know, I've I've started doing that, uh, and it seems like there are, but that process is slow, um, and you can imagine that it's hard often to find a fit, right? A partner who has an actual um, need that you can fill. Um, I'm wondering about student interest, the kind of work and outcomes are quite different than a typical data science class. So I'm just curious about how that will happen. Uh, we don't have a curriculum for this. I, I, there's a lot of us in my department. My, I love my department. There's a lot of us who have been talking about this. We'll develop the curriculum, um, I think, over the next few years for a course like this. And then I, I think a lot about sustainability. Like, um, kind of developing this, these kinds of relationships, again, takes a long time. And I wonder about how you can um, set up some system where uh, you can make it sustainable, both for the partner and uh, for the faculty member or students who are participating. Okay, so thanks a lot. Uh, I know we have limited time. I can't, I'm leaving for vacation like right after this, so I can't participate in the coffee hour unfortunately, but I would love to hear from you if you have any ideas. 
Uh, so please email me. Uh, there's my email address. Um, and I'll thank all the people who have collaborated or funded this and um, put up a couple links here. So I'll leave this up for just a little while, but I'm happy to take questions. So uh, Shalad, can you hear me? Okay, great, it's yeah. Chad. Um, I, I heard the rumor that you, yes, will moderate your own Q&A, which is awesome. I'm jumping in to say one uh, quick thing first. I'm taking a point of cue side privilege um, just to embarrass you a little, um, but to express like genuine thanks because what, what people in this call um, might not know is that like the very first project I ever did that set me on the path towards co-founding QSide was this project about like diversity on um, math journal editorial boards. And that is a project that I had the incredible good fortune to work on with Shalad. And he literally taught me all of the methodology for like kind of thinking about things the way I have, you know, learned to think about them. And, um, and so like, it's sort of not an exaggeration to say that like in a way there wouldn't be a QSide if like, if not for all of that stuff that you had um, taught me. And so like, thank you so much for the influence you have and the like wisdom that you have shared. It's a big deal. So to me. Oh, I appreciate that, Chad. I have, I have received way more value than I put into that. Uh, so <laughs> it, the feeling is, is mutual. Okay. Love fest. Sweet. Uh, so now questions for Shalad. Um, I wanted to jump in. I did write down this question. Uh, let me know if it makes sense. But I was thinking about your collective action section, which I really appreciated. And thank you for sharing all of that with us. And I wanted to ask, has this past summer with all of the uh, using social media as a really prominent and public organizing tool, has that affected at all how you like understand or engage with your research or going forward maybe? Yeah. Boy, that's a complicated question. To answer, okay, so, so, yes, it has affected it deeply. I'd say that approach. I, I I'm really interested in that line of research, and I think it's really important. There's a lot of um, uh, work that we're following up on. Some of that work, um, Nick, not me, but Nick and and Brent have turned into. Um, kind of white papers or memorandums from, from to, to government officials. And so that, that is great. However, I mean, personally, I am interested in keeping doing that work, but I am more interested in poking, focusing on this other type of work, which, you know, I'm just, I just kind of described as a vision for data science, but this direct work that is directly in partnership with, with folks. So, um, th and that's what, the events of this summer, you know, being in Minneapolis have made me think like I, I have to start working harder to build direct relationships so that I can work more directly and support with people. So I guess, I guess the events of this summer have made me pivot a little bit away from this big data way of thinking. That's consistent with what is in the data feminism book too, I have to say. Okay, it's Chad, I'm gonna ask another one. And folks, by the way, in case it's not clear, you can put your questions into the uh, Q&A box, which hopefully you should you should have access to. Um, okay, so Shalad, you said this thing about like downloading the data sets, uh, like, you know, like, like just whatever, the data sets that you can download for Kaggle or whatever. And like, I totally agree about that viewpoint. I share that viewpoint. Like, I'm curious though for your feedback on one thing, like the one thing that's been super interesting to me is like data sets that you can download that are very problematic and like the activism you can do around those. And this is like in my mind because like uh, some collaborators and I just did this project that was about like incarceration in New York City during the early days of COVID. And like we found out that the way New York City keeps its public facing jail data, all inmates have race categorized as black, Asian, or unknown. Like that's literally what we discovered from like downloading their data. And so that got me thinking of like, 
what about the, like, what about the, do you have thoughts about like that aspect of like the stuff you can just download, but like using that to like shine a light on what's wrong with the data rather than like doing stuff with the data? Yeah, I know what you're saying. So you're saying, you're, you're wondering about the, the tension between trying to fix the underlying problems that resulted in this crappy data uh, uh, and not actually being able to do anything with the data itself versus using this problematic data and trying to do what you can with it. I, so I have uh, friends who feel very strongly about this one way or the other. Um, I mean, one thing I know about you, Chad, is when you, when you do work based on this type of data, and this is true also, you know, when we published our work on, um, the math editorial boards, like we used some name, gender name inference software, which is problematic. Um, and, but I, I would say, and, and it's important to highlight why it's problematic and it leaves people out. At, at the same time, there's a lot of power that comes from sharing the discrepancies uh, at, at, level, at high levels of aggregation. So I feel like I, under, you know, I understand the perspective of folks who, who just feel like you shouldn't use data ever at that high level of ag aggregation. But I think there are, there are, it's complicated, I guess. I'm, I, I totally didn't answer your question. Hashtag gets complicated. I agree. And thank you for, thanks for that. It's awesome. I got a question. Let's see. Regarding the slide about how different tagging systems evolved over time, can you explain what the four um, different systems were? Oh, yeah. Right. Um, sure. So I'll pull up that slide real quick. Um, slides as virtual background. Oh, my gosh. What's going to happen now? I'm, Oh no, I'm not going to do that. Basic uh, keynote share. Okay, so now you're seeing my slides and I'll go back. I feel really con self-conscious doing this now because I watched that video of someone pretending that they were doing this during a class and it was so on point. Okay, so this is, uh, yeah. So this is the question that um, Henry Adams was asking about. So what, what are these four systems that evolve such different vocabulary? Unshared, in the unshared universe, people could only see the tags they applied and no other tags. So this is like a very, the only motivations in that universe are selfish. And so you see this green personal line with tags like my DVDs grows proportionally larger because there's no real value except your own personal entertainment in describing things subjectively, for example. These other three universes, people could see each other's tags and the algorithm that chose to um, make tags visible ranked them slightly differently, different ranking algorithms. So shared was a random ranking algorithm. Shared pop just chose the most popular ones and shared rec was a smarter algorithm. And so it's actually not surprising that in these two universes, there are more factual tags shown because those tend to have more agreement, right, than the subjective tags. That's part of what defines that categorization itself. Well, thank you so much, Shalad, for all of this. I feel like I have a million thoughts a minute going through my brain right now, so I'll definitely be emailing you. Um, thank you so, every so much, everyone, for coming out today. If you are interested, we are going to be letting Shalad go as he needs to uh, get, on, get on the road. But there is a virtual cocktail hour that we'll be hosting, uh, and I've just dropped the link for that in the chat. So you can switch over to that if you would like to continue talking with us. But again, thank you for sharing with us today, Shalad. We really appreciate it, and we hope you have a great night. It was my pleasure. Thank you for asking me. <laughs>